Okay. The League of Women Voters of Jefferson County welcomes you to the 2020 Candidate Forum for the Office of Magistrate. This forum is being recorded on April 16, 2020, and will be posted for public viewing on our League of Women Voters webpage as soon as we figure out how to do it. The coronavirus has made us adjust our typical forum format. Tonight, we are using Zoom, a teleconferencing approach that allows the candidates to participate from the comfort of their homes. This approach is definitely new to the League of Women Voters and probably to many of our candidates, so please be patient with all of us. The League of Women Voters has required all candidates wishing to be part of the forum to schedule a one-on-one -on -one training session with our techno expert, Terry Thorson. The candidates appearing tonight have all taken advantage of that training. We greatly appreciate their commitment to be part of this forum. My name is Lynn Widmeyer, and I will be the moderator for tonight's adventure into the world of cyber forums. Tonight, we are focusing on candidates for the nonpartisan position of magistrate. There are other nonpartisan offices on the ballot. Uh, we hope to provide a forum for school board candidates later this spring. Two other nonpartisan offices will appear on the ballot. One is the Office of Circuit Court Judge, and the other is for the Conservation District Supervisor for the Eastern Panhandle District. Both these offices feature unopposed candidates. The League of Women Voters policy for unopposed candidates is to allow them two minutes to introduce themselves to voters. We will start the forum with these introductions before proceeding to our main event, the Office of Magistrate. So let's get underway. Let me remind the candidates tonight that we will tell you when your time is up and please finish your thought at that point. And again, the time limit for uh, the introduction is uh, two minutes for our two unopposed candidates. Deborah McLaughlin is the unopposed candidate for circuit court judge. Judge, you have two minutes to tell us about yourself. I am Judge Deborah McLaughlin. I currently serve as one of the six circuit court judges in the Eastern Panhandle. I come to that position after serving 20 years as a prosecuting attorney in Morgan County and prior to that, five years in private practice. I was appointed to that position following the retirement of Judge Christopher Wilkes. As the circuit court judge, I preside over matters such as civil proceedings, abuse and neglects, criminal felony matters, juvenile matters, guardianships, um, family court appeals. Basically, we are the court of record for West Virginia. I moved to West Virginia in 1999 with my husband, Dr. Kevin McLaughlin, and son, Colin. Since residing here in Morgan County, my family has grown um, to include Catherine and Aaron. I now live in Berkeley County um, in Falling Waters. I enjoy watching my kids play soccer, crocheting, reading, playing cards with my family, and studying the law. Communication with judges is considered somewhat taboo because judges are supposed to be fair and impartial and all communication with judges occur in the courtroom and on the record. Um, despite that, um, I think it's also important for judges to be part of the community, to know their community and get out there and meet folks. So I wanted to take advantage of these two minutes to speak with you and introduce myself to you. My proudest moments on the bench is having started the or restarted the Jefferson County Juvenile Drug Court. Um, I am proud to see it back up and running. We have grown even during this coronavirus from five participants to seven participants. We've seen our candidates advance, three out of those seven advance to phase two, and one of those graduate from high school. Um, dr juvenile Drug Court is basically for at-risk children, the ones that might otherwise be kicked out of school or removed from their homes due to their drug use. Lastly, I want to make sure that you understand that even though court is not happening in the courtroom right now due to the virus, the pandemic, um, court is still functioning. We appear for hearings via telephone, via Skype, and uh, matters proceed as they are scheduled. Thank you. Um, Thank you, 
Judge McLaughlin. I, forward, I just wanted to say that I look forward to serving you and uh, thank you for your vote. Thank you for participating tonight. Our thank next, you for having me. Our next uh, nonpartisan office seeker is um, Daniel Lutz, who is seeking the position of Conservation District Supervisor. Again, he is unopposed. So, Mr. Lutz, you have two minutes to tell us about yourself. Well, thank you very much to the League of Women Voters and to all the other candidates who have generously given their time and talents to help put this together. I am the incumbent of the, of the two Jefferson County Conservation District Supervisors of the Eastern Panhandle District, which is one of 13 districts uh, uh, comprising the state of West Virginia. One of the, th of the things that we are known for doing most are fencing and soil conservation programs and stream bank easements and such as that. However, our duties are going to change in the next four years before my term is up because we have set three priorities besides all the programs that we are doing. The first priority is safe drinking water and to, to assure that the water coming out of the Eastern Panhandle is as clean when it leaves as when it came in. The second is to make an environment suitable for our pollinators. And I'm talking about honeybees, bumblebees, wasps, butterflies, a whole plethora of insects that are essential to keeping our, our products, our, our crops pollinated and ready to, to reproduce. And third, we are going to make a concerted effort to be reaching out to our non-agricultural cooperators. It will, we will no longer be just down on the farm because there are so many fewer farms and they are so much bigger and conservation at all levels involves all people in our given districts. We, in addition to the funding we get from the state and federal programs, we also seek grant money from such as the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the, uh, the, the, the West Virginia Rivers Coalition, and uh, other, other charitable organizations that come our way. It's a, it, it's a busy job. It's far busier than I anticipated when I first sought the office four years ago. However, I'm glad that I did because I've made some tremendous acquaintances and I've also had some interesting responsibilities. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lutz. Um, thank you for participating uh, to both our um, candidates, unopposed candidates. Um, and we can now move to the forum for magistrate candidates. Uh, before we begin, let me just go over a few, uh, a few reminders for the voters. There are three magistrate divisions in Jefferson County, cleverly named Division I, Division II, and Division Three. Voters will vote for one candidate from Division I, one candidate from Division Two, and one candidate from Division Three. District Two features an unopposed candidate, Ms. Vicki D'Angelo. Consistent with our uh, League of Women Voters policy, Ms. D'Angelo is not included in tonight's form because she is unopposed. There are uh, three candidates, however, seeking office in Division One, and three candidates in Division Three. And they are all here with us tonight. And thank you so much for, for being here. Our format for this part of the forum will start with each candidate giving opening remarks for one minute. We will then have a question and answer period. Typically, we ask the audience to ask questions, but obviously we cannot do that tonight. So the League of Women Voter members have prepared the questions. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the questions. We will conclude the forum with a two minute closing statement by each candidate. Again, a reminder to the candidates that we will let you know when your time is up and please finish your thoughts at that time. With all the housekeeping items out of the way, let's begin and everyone cross their fingers, technology does not let us down. <laughs> 
Um, we will hear first from candidates from Division I in the order they appear on the ballot. And each of you will have one minute. So um, we will start with uh, Carmela Cesare. Carmela? Hello, thank you for having me. As a former prosecutor with over 20 years of courtroom experience, I am the most qualified candidate for this judicial position. Since graduating from the WVU School of Law in 1993, I've done the hard work of defending the Constitution, both as defense counsel and as prosecution. I've lived here in Jefferson County with my husband for 27 years, and we've raised three lovely children here as well. I co-own a small business, I participate on local boards, and I'm active in my church. I'm also endorsed by former sheriff and magistrate Bill Sensony and by three former prosecutors, John Skinner, Pamela Jean Gaines Neely, and Mike Thompson. In short, the job of a magistrate is to make legal decisions regarding people's liberty and property rights. In order to competently do this job, one must have a good working knowledge of the law. With me, there will be no on-the-job training. My 20 years of excuse me, my 20 plus years of litigation experience means that you can trust my decisions. Thank you so much for your time and your vote on June 9th. Thank you. Our next candidate is uh, Ms. Kristen Vogel. Ms. Vogel, you have um, one minute. Hi, my name's Kristen Vogel. I am a resident of Jefferson County. I've been here since 2005 with my husband and two children. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. I'm also working on my master's degree in criminal justice. So I definitely have the education to fulfill the seat as magistrate in Jefferson County. I currently also work at the Ransom Police Department as administrative assistant, um, where I do a lot of paperwork um, and also get experience there on that side of the criminal justice system, if you wanna call it. Um, I do also own a small business in Jefferson County. I do a lot of community work in the county. I do a lot of school work for the school that my children go to. I'm the PTO president there. So I have a lot of community involvement in the schools, in the community, um, as well as sports. And with my education, my personal background, my military experience, I think I would be a great candidate for this position for many, many years to come. Thank you. Our next candidate from um, Division One is Den Denisha. I hope, I hope I'm pronounced Denisha uh, Chikariki. Ms. Chikariki. Good evening. My name is Denisha Chikariki, and I'm running for Magister in Division One. I reside in Charlestown with my husband, who works for his family-owned business that's been in Jefferson County for over 50 years. My two children, my 11-year-old daughter Ava and my eight-year-old son Jake, who both attend school in Jefferson County when it's back in school. <laughs> um, I've been a senior bail agent, bail bondsman for Weatherholds Bonding for the last 17 years, as well as being a community liaison office manager for a local nonprofit agency. In my spare time, I enjoy volunteering with Girl Scouts, Ransom Park and Recreation, and West Virginia Fest. The magistrate role, in my opinion, is to be the people's judge. I feel that my compassion for others, common sense, impartiality, and resourcefulness would be instrumental and being an effective magistrate to the people of Jefferson County. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of Jefferson County for hosting this forum this evening, and I look forward to hearing everyone else speak this evening. <laughs> thank you. We will now, go, as, as I mentioned before, the um, K Division Two magistrate is unopposed, so we will move on to Division Three, And we, again, uh, I'll introduce people in the order they are on the ballot, and that brings us to uh, Ms. Holly Silvius. Good evening. I am Holly Silvius. I'm running for Magistrate Division Three. Um, I'm a, law, a lifelong resident here of Jefferson County, born and raised. I'm a local school teacher. I graduated from Chevrolet College in 2003. I'm a mom of two. I have a three-year-old and a 10-year-old. I'm also a business owner here in Jefferson County. I try to stay as involved as I can in the community and I have a lot of strong community ties. I feel like I would be a great candidate for magistrate because I've lived here my whole life. I've seen it grow and change and I feel like the magistrate position is a position that represents the people and in order to do that they need somebody that is one of them and that can help keep 
the community safe for um, many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate from Division Three is Ms. Arthena Roper. Ms. Roper? Good. You are unmuted. Okay. Good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for this opportunity to share my values with the voters of Jefferson County. I am Arthena Roper, your newest magistrate serving in Division Three. I believe the judicial system is an important part of the balance of our society. That is why in my courtroom, I show dignity and respect, and I expect and hold every participant to the same high standards. I hope through this forum, you're able to assess my sincerity, my values, and my desire to continue to serve as magistrate in Jefferson County in Division Three. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roper. And our um, final candidate in Division Three is Mr. Osmond Anderson. <clears throat> Mr. Anderson. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank the women, the ladies women voters for hosting this event. My name is Osmond Anderson. I was raised in Southeast Washington, D.C. My father was a Pentecostal preacher. I entered the military right after high school. I am a husband, I am a father, I am a grandfather, and I am a great, great grandfather to three. I had to leave men and women during my military career. I have seen diversity of individuals in the best days and the worst days of their life. I had to understand the emotions and absolution they required to be successful. In my career today, pursuing my education, not only in social work, also the administration and court system on the victim and the offended side. I see the offender being punished. However, no resolution for the victims. My goal is to ensure the administration of the law, equitable manner, and closure to the victim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. We will now um, move on to uh, questions. Again, you have one minute to respond, and I've done the best to rotate how you answer them um, by division and by your place within the division. So everybody, uh, that's probably the, the hardest part of the whole form. <laughs> so let's start um, with the first question, which is, how do you think the COVID-19 quarantine and changing economic conditions will affect the number and types of cases in magistrate court? And we'll start with division three with Ms. Roper. Thank you, thank you. I can tell you what I have seen in the court system in the last month, and that is a rise in domestic violence. Uh, <clears throat> charges in domestic violence. Not necessarily that there has been violence, but the charges have been there. There have been more family protective orders in, are you timing me, Mom? <laughs> I'm trying to keep track of my time here. Uh, we'll let you know, don't. Okay, all right, thank we'll you. you know. But yes, the family protective orders have gone up. And you can understand that because of being uh, confined together longer than most of us have had to, to do. But um, that's part of the job. And uh, leaving out late at night is something that we as magistrates do. And I'm happy to do it if to know that I'm serving uh, people who fear for their life and um, need protecting. So thank you. That's what I've seen. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Um, how do you think the COVID-19 quarantine and changing economic conditions will affect the number and type of cases in magistrate court? I feel that the pandemic will affect what's going on right now in the magistrate court because of the fact that the voters could not get out to vote and meet the candidates. And with that being said, the way that things are being structured as far as us doing stuff on Zoom, that... Um, 
we trying to find a connect between us and the voters. So at the end of the day, I just believe that um, it's just affecting everybody worldwide. And we all are actually going through it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Silvius, would you like me to re repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. How do you think the COVID-19 quarantine and changing economic conditions will affect the number and types of cases in magistrate court? Um, from the pandemic, as I said earlier, I am a school teacher. So part of what I have to do right now is do wellness checks on my students. So kind of like Ms. Roper said, the, the rise in domestic. Um, I have seen that kind of be a trend. And as a mandated reporter, I have to keep an eye on the children. So I also worry about um, some of the cases that could come in as a result of CPS cases. Um, the economic aspect is causing a lot of hardship on a lot of people not being able to work and things like that. So it's put a lot of people in a stressful situation. So I can see how the domestic part could play a big role in some of the upcoming cases that are going to be heard in magistrate court. Um, we need to do everything we can to keep everybody safe, but we also have to protect ourselves from putting ourselves in a situation where we could come in contact with the virus and things like that. Anytime you're sheltered and trapped in, it makes it really, really hard on people. So I feel like that's kind of going to be the rise right now. And if it continues for a long time, I can kind of see where maybe, um, burglaries and things like that could come into play. People trying to just make ends meet and it, it could turn ugly, but I'm hoping that things will even out and um, things will get lifted and we can kind of get back to some sort of normal. Thank you. We'll now uh, ask the same question of candidates in division one. Uh, Ms. Vogel, how do you think the quarantine and changing economic conditions will affect the number and type of cases in magistrate court? Um, I think the current situation that we're under right now is bringing a lot of stress to people's lives. Um, I do agree that there's going to be a lot more domestic issues that may not be able to be handled outside of the courtroom, so they're going to start to filter in. But I also think there's going to be a lot more mental health cases coming in. People who suffer from depression, it's going to get darker for them. People who are borderline, they don't know if they have depression. They're going to come out and realize that they do have it and not know how to handle it. So I think the mental health issues are going to rise um, sooner than later. I don't think we're going to going to see a lot of truancy issues, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll ask the same question of Ms. Chikariki. How do you think the quarantine uh, and changing economic conditions will affect cases in the magistrate court? Well, I have to agree with Magistrate Roper only because as a bondsman, I have posted uh, more domestic battery bonds here lately than I have on a usual basis. And it comes with the con being confined. And, you know, I, I jokingly tell my husband, you know, he's luckily he's an essential employee, but if he were be, to be quarantined with me, I could easily see, I could easily see where people come to that. <laughs> I'm joking, but <laughs> I do see that, you know, the, the you get stressed out. The stressors are there, you know, stress of whether you're going to have a loss of income, being confined. So it, it is. It's, it's affecting the courts and there is a rise. And, you know, the magistrates are doing the best that they can and they're getting out there. You know, they're getting called out. And of course, when they get called out, I'm called out as well. And um, so, yes, the, the COVID is, is affecting mental health as well as economic. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chesery, how do you think the quarantine will affect the number and type of cases in magistrate court? The first thing that popped into my mind was actually domestic cases and emergency protective orders, and Arthena basically validated what my thought was on that. That's what she's seen. Um, so because of what everybody else is saying, the stress of having to stay home, the worry of is there going to be enough money to pay the bills, um, causes people to react in ways that they probably wish that they hadn't. If this does continue on and our cases can, our, our, our courts continue to be shut down out of necessity, there's going to be a concern about backlogs of cases because we still have cases coming in. And so there's probably going to be a shift in how cases are handled. Um, Rule 45 permits certain cases to be heard. And so probably if there are cases like, for example, a criminal case has been resolved between the parties, you could probably enter in 
do a guilty plea by, um, by video. So there's certain cases that you can do by video, and that probably will start happening um, if the judges and the magistrates start to feel that there's a risk of a backlog happening. Thank you. We'll now go on to our second question. And with this question, we'll start with the Division I candidates. And the question is, what is the most important qualification you have for the position of magistrate? We'll start with Division I, Ms. Chikariki. The, I think the, and I'm sorry, could you re repeat that again? I apologize. Sure. sure, that's okay. What is the most important qualification you have for the position of magistrate? Um, honestly, I, I believe it comes down to common sense. It's, you know, my opinion, you, you have to have a good sense of people. And there's, you know, with that particular role, it does not, um, you know, the code states that you're 21 years old and a, a good moral torpitude, but, you know, good common sense, just being able to be impartial and see both sides of the story and to be fair. So... Those are Thank some things that can play into that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chesery? So, um, those are good Let points. Let me repeat the question, I'm sorry. What no, is I'm the most important qualification you have for the position of magistrate? My legal training and experience of over 22 years in courtroom litigation. There are a lot of things that go into being a magistrate. Magistrates issue bench warrants, search warrants, arrest warrants. They um, hear, they conduct jury trials um, and you need to know the law in order to be able to do that. You need to be familiar with the statutes. You need to be familiar with the rules of evidence. You need to be familiar with the trial court rules, the rules of criminal procedure, and you need to be familiar with all the case law that interprets all those statutes and rules. So it's important to know what's going on so you can do a good job in addition to being fair and, and impartial. Thank you. Ms. Vogel, what is the most important qualification you have for the position of magistrate? Um, I believe that with my education, I have a very long education in criminal justice. It kind of overscopes everything that goes on in the criminal justice system with the courts and the police and the law enforcement. But also my military background gives me the leadership and the integrity to do a good job at the job that I will be doing. So I believe with my experience between education, my work experience, and my leadership skills, I think I would be a great qualified candidate. Thank you. We will now proceed to division three and I'll ask the same question. What is the most important qualification you have for the position of magistrate? And we'll start with Mr. Anderson. <clears throat> I would say my strong leadership and my military background, I have the ability to relate and work with others. I have respect for their opinions. I have the maturity to be firm and make decisions when necessary. Also, I bring an outstanding ability to communicate. I am a good listener and I process information. I am also diverse. This would allow me to evaluate each case from many perspectives. I have the ability to continue to learn and grow when elected as magistrate division three. I will use this knowledge in complex issues and follow the laws to keep all citizens in Jefferson County safe. Vote Osmond Anderson for magistrate. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Silvius, what is your most important qualification for the position of magistrate? Thank you. When it comes down to it, you have to be a sound decision maker and you have to be able to listen to both sides impartially. And that is something I feel that I am very qualified with, um, being able to listen, not make snap judges judgments, and also be able to um, not assume that I know everything, be willing to look into things, make sure that I'm making the best decision, do the work. I'm a hard worker and I'm not afraid to put the work in. So I feel like common sense is important as well as being fair, impartial, balanced, and not, um, I don't know how to say it, not 
like I said, not making snap decisions and things like that. You have to make them based on the facts and you have to be willing to listen, not let your opinions of certain situations um, cloud your judgment. Thank you. Um, Ms. Roper, what is the most important qualification you have for the position of magistrate? My most important qualification is my experience. I am the incumbent magistrate. I learn every day. I believe that the three master's degrees that I hold has given me the skills that I need to research cases, to understand what is coming before me. But mostly, my character, the qualification that I bring is my high integrity and that I'm thoughtful. It's my demeanor. My, I would say that that is my best qualification that I bring to the job of magistrate in Jefferson County. Thank you. Uh, with our next question, we'll start with division three candidates. And the question is, what in your opinion is the purpose of bail? What factors or circumstances will you consider when setting bail? And we'll start again in division three, this time with Ms. Silvius. When it comes to bail, I know that um, there are guidelines set and there are suggested amounts and usually it's kind of on a scale from what I understand um, based on the severity of the crime. I know that Ms. Chikariki can speak a lot more to this than I can as I'm not a sitting magistrate nor a bondsman. But um, I think in order to set a fair amount for bail, you need to look at the situation, the severity, the um, risk involved if the person makes bail. Um, and take all of that into consideration. And I feel that that goes back to being able to make sound decisions, listen to both sides, and um, make the best decision based on fairness in the situation and the safety of the people involved. Thank you. And I'll ask the same question to Ms. Roper. Uh, what's your, uh, is your opinion of the purpose of bail and what factors will you consider when setting bail? Yes, as a magistrate, I do set bail uh, when I arraigned individuals uh, on a daily basis. And the first thing that I do is I look at the criminal complaint, the severity of the criminal complaint. And I look at the, what the maximum fine is for that offense, if they are found guilty or if they plead guilty. And then I look to see if they are repeat offenders. If, because the purpose of bail is to ensure that the defendant shows up to court, appears in court. And so bail is set to see if, I may set it a little higher, if I need to have a bondsman make sure, they're called surety bonds, that the person will show up to court. Uh, if, if it's a first time offense, if, if they're um, if they have ties to the community, I will uh, maybe set a lesser bond because I can trust that they'll show up to court. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. What is your opinion on the purpose of bail, and what factors would you consider when setting bail? The factors that I would consider as far as setting bail, because I have I have never been a magistrate. That's why I'm running. I'm not a setting magistrate. But I believe the bill is simply to ensure that defendants will appear for trial or pre-trial hearings. And so I really can't answer that question as far as me setting, set, setting the bill. But once I get the knowledge. Whoops, I, I think we've lost Mr. I answer that question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Anderson, we lost part of that. Did you want to take another? Yes, I'm right here. Hello. Okay. Uh, we lost a few, we lost um, audio for a few seconds. Did you just want to say a sentence, one more sentence? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I would like to. I was just saying that I'm not a city magistrate. Magistrate. That's why I'm running. I believe that bill is simply to ensure that defendants will, will appear for trial or pre-trial hearings. But until I get the magistrate training, I really can't answer that question any further. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll now go to the candidates in Division One and start with Ms. Scissory. Oh, and the question is, what in your opinion is the purpose of bail and what factors would you consider when setting bail? So under the law, the purpose of bail is only to ensure the defendant's appearance at, at a hearing. And I've litigated numerous hearings uh, regarding bail. Having said that, there is a case that the Supreme Court gave us years ago called Giz versus Johnson that lays out the factors that a judge is supposed to take into consideration when setting bail. And basically the, these factors are is that um, the seriousness of the crime, uh, the defendant's criminal history, and the defendant's ties to the community. So um, sometimes we take evidence to, to see, to, to, to litigate that. Um, but those are, in a nutshell, that's what you need to, to be thinking about when you're a judge. Thank you. Ms. Vogel, what is your opinion on the purpose of bail and what factors would you consider when setting bail? So the purpose of a bail is pretty much the defendant's promise that they will show up to their hearing on the date and time that their hearing is set for. Um, when setting bail for a defendant, you need to look at the offense, um, the severity of the offense, is the defendant a risk factor, um, are they a repeat offender, and how, again, also how are they tied to the community. Um, those are pretty much the things that you need to look for when setting a bail. Thank you. Ms. Chikoriki, um, your thoughts on the purpose of bail and what yes. would you consider when setting it? For, so bail is to ensure that your defendant appears in court. And what's really important when you're setting a bond is you, you're, vetting, you're vetting out the defendant. You need to make sure you have to assess the risk. Assess they're not a flight risk. Um, you need to see the severity of the charges, their criminal history. Um, the bail is there to make sure that they show up for court. Um, but one thing that I, I need to add is that, you know, that the way bail is imposed is there's a maximum and a minimum. Okay, there's a, you can't go over, you know, X amount of dollars or the minimum on this particular charge and there's a maximum. But in my opinion, a, a magistrate um, or any judge should not use um, when people, I, I keep hearing community, how they're community oriented, um, you cannot use it to, um, it's my best verbiage is, you don't use bail to, um, when, when someone's with bail, you don't want to use it as, as a catalyst or to say, oh, well, you know, gee, I know who that person is and they're not a good person. I'm going to put it at the maximum. So, I mean, you have to go by, use, use your sound judgment and the statutes of the law and fall within the law and not use it as punishment. Thank you. Um, our next question will begin with division one and the question is to get to know a little bit more about you. What community service activities have you been involved with in Jefferson County? We'll start with division one, Ms. Vogel. So as far as community service, I can use the past four weeks as a great example um, as the PTO president of my children's school, I have been running food back and forth um, from food pickup locations to families who cannot get to the locations when the times are set or to the families who can't afford to feed their children all week because now their children are home for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I've been feeding over 20 children every week by going to the Boys and Girls Club and picking up um, dinners and going to the school buses on whatever day they are and picking up pre-box lunches. So on those days, I drive back and forth and deliver food. Thank you. Ms. Chikoriki, could you tell us about your voluntary community service activities? Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been a volunteer with the Girl Scouts for, oh, 10 years. Um, I have actively volunteer with Ransom Parks and Recreation, with um, with the uh, Pizza with Santa, and that's open to any child. I've been involved in that for numerous years for any child in the county um, that has an opportunity to um, have Pizza with Santa. And, you know, it's, I think it's good to have um, some community ties and I, I try to promote um, for my children to be civil minded. So they, they go with me and they help out as well because a lot of, it's a good, 
it's a good experience for them to see that there are children in this area that they don't have food and a lot of them may not get anything for Christmas. So it's important for them to see that they have to give back to their community. Um, so I'm very civil minded. Um, I also volunteer with uh, Charlestown with the West Virginia Fest and um, you know any, any organization that I can help with, whether it's Kids Power Pack or it's Feeding Children and just trying to help in the community, I, I'm trying to be involved in as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chesery, what voluntary community activities are you involved with? I think the biggest thing that I'm involved with right now is the Board of Health here in Jefferson County. We've been pretty um, involved in making sure that the community is, um, is complying with the, judge, the governor's orders uh, in a way that is fair to everybody. Um, there has been con some concern, but I think that we've, we've done everything in our power to make sure that, you know, there, there's been a little bit of rockiness happening there, but I think it's because this is new for everyone and we've managed to get that figured out. Um, so that's the big one. Um, I also am, in the past, I've served um, as a board member for the Contemporary American Theater Festival for nine years. Um, when my girls were younger, I used to, I was active in their, in their school and also with regards to my, my church, I'm currently serving on the pastoral council of my church. I'm also bread and cup at my church. And I also participate in helping to serve the homeless through the church. So those are just a few of the things that I do here in the community. Thank you. Now we'll move to the division three candidates and I'll ask Ms. Roper about her voluntary community service activities and involvement in Jefferson County. Yes. Public service is what I do. Uh, I joined a, a sorority, a national sorority, about 30 years ago, and we have a local chapter called Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Uh, we're called the Eastern Panhandle Alumni Chapter of that organization. And through that organization, wow, what don't we do? Uh, just recently, um, last week, we got masks delivered to the staff at the Boys and Girls Club who are serving meals to thousands of students, well, students uh, who are out of school right now. Uh, <clears throat> I am the past president of the Store College Alumni Association. That's keeping the Store College here in Jefferson County, the legacy of that renewed I am a member of the WISH Foundation, that's um, women investing in Shepherd College, Shepherd University. I am a lifetime member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roper. Mr. Anderson, what uh, voluntary community activities have you been involved with in Jefferson County? Some of the volunteers um, activities that I've been involved with is uh, the Boys and Girls Club in Berkeley County. I had the opportunity to um, work with them as far as uh, feeding the kids at the Boys and Girls Club. Also working with um, Challenge of, also working with Challenge Kids at the Boys and Girls Club while uh, I attend Shepherd University right now and so my BA degree. I had the opportunity to work with the college students as far as me mentoring them. And right now, quite naturally, I have my two great grandkids because of the pandemic. I know that's family, but I got the opportunity to oversee them and guide them. Being four six, that's a hard task, but I'm making it work. Also, I am involved with the uh, military ministry um, at my church as far as us going out, uh, witnesses, you know, to the individuals that's on the street and making sure that they're well fed. So those are the things that I am constantly involved with. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Silvius, could you tell us about your voluntary community service activities? Sure thing. In the past, I served as team mom for my son's baseball team, and I volunteered a lot um, of time and organized some fundraisers and things for that. Business holds spirit nights for different organizations, such as Relay for Life, um, the chapter of SAD, different schools um, and different fundraisers for that. I've donated um, lots of prizes and things of that nature to different schools to reward things such as um, good attendance, improving grades and things like that. 
I speak to the Girl Scout troops um, every year. I've also been involved in the fair as a judge for different um, different divisions of the handicrafts and the baking and things like that. Um, at school, like I said, I'm a teacher. I am one of the people who um, children check in with um, as kind of like a good choices thing. They come and check in with me and let me um, hear how their day is and see if I can kind of guide them on the right path to having a good day and um, things like that. Um, so I do a lot with the kids and stuff in the community. Thank you. Um, our next question will start with the division three candidates. And the question is, what is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with? And how are you educating yourself on that issue? And we'll start with division three candidates uh, with Mr. Anderson. Is he, Mr. Anderson? I don't think. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Would you say that question again? Oh, sure, sure, sure. What is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with, and how are you educating you? And how are you educating yourself on that issue? Did Did you get that? Uh -oh. Yes, ma'am, I got that, and I'm going to ask a question. I had the opportunity to do my internship over, over at the Victim Assistance Program right there in Jefferson County, so I had the opportunity to interact with, with victims on a daily basis. And I also had the opportunity to go over to the court um, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays to interact with the uh, court, and I dealt with a whole lot of cases, and one of the cases that really stood out to me was a young man that uh, molested a child. And um, I tell you, that right there really, really broke my heart. And how I was able to deal with that was for me to go to my supervisor, which was dead before some guidance in that area because I was, um, I didn't have the experience. But just going over to the court system and watching the process and dealing with that case, it really made me a better person. And how I educated myself is about, is, is because of the fact that I was asking a lot of questions and I actually pulled that case to learn more about the case in depth. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Silvius, uh, what is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with and how are you educating yourself on that issue? One of the things that I look at is um, child abuse and neglect. With being a school teacher, I have the duty as a mandated reporter. So that's something that I have looked into. I don't know if it would be something that is number one, but it's something that I, um, and have been looking into because it's something that, especially with the pandemic going on, I feel like we're gonna see a lot more of that. So I have looked at the resources that are provided through school, through the DHHR and things like that to figure out um, what needs to be done and the steps that are taken in a process like that to help children. Thank you. Ms. Roper, what is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with and how are you educating yourself on that issue? The number one issue that I deal with is driving under the influence. The way that driving under the influence of alcohol and or drugs, and the way that I educate myself on that is several ways. One, there's a program that first time DUI offenders can enter into. And so I interviewed people who went through that program because I need to know what it is that I am agreeing to allow them to uh, plead to. Uh, and also, I went to visit the Eastern Regional Jail. We deal with people there every day. I need to know what is the process when someone is arrested? Where are they held? What are the conditions like? Uh, when I speak with them, where, where am I speaking to them um, from? All those things give me a good understanding of driving under the influence as a crime that is high on my docket list. 
Thank you. We'll now ask the same um, question for the Division I candidates, and we'll start with Ms. Chikariki. What is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with, and how are you educating yourself on that issue? Okay, well, the, the main, the, the biggest legal issue that I would look at would be, um, as Magistrate Roper said, driving under the influence, whether it be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And what I would um, would say is, I would, I'm wanting to utilize the resources, and the resources are there. Um, vetting it out to see if that driving under the influence of alcohol is that person is eligible for the interlock program. If that's something there that they're, it's a basically a blow and go device where they can go through the proper channels to have that put on and they can still be functioning and go, and go to work every day and have the blow and go device. Um, another resource that I think that needs to be utilized more is the day report center. Um, you know, as with the opiate, uh, opiate addictions that are out there, if we can try to um, be proactive and get some of these people that are just, there's their first offense with any type of drugs, get them to the day report center, get them in there so they can get the resources that they need. Because I think, you know, it's easy to fall off path. It really is. But if you can get them the resources that are needed, you know, you can get them back on the right path and get them rehabbed and before it becomes an issue. So I'm all about utilizing the resources. Thank you. Ms. Cesare. Oh, the, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? What is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with and how are you educating yourself on that issue? So I'm gonna take this backwards. Um, with regards to educating myself on the issue, I have experience, I don't, I'm already educated and I continue to educate myself through my continuing legal education credits. I'm also through my experience and practice, I, I know as Arthena was saying, you know, she went out to the jail to see where these people are. I've spent many hours in the jail talking to people, preparing them for trial. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've got the background for this and the education with regards to, you know, what is the number one legal issue. Um, in my experience, magistrate court is pretty, Oh, uh, okay, uh, restart your thought. <laughs> Again, um, in my experience, magistrate court is quite varied in, in what you see for cases. Um, and so a lot of different cases come in front of the magistrate court. The one that I'm thinking about the most though is the emergency protective orders because those are very touchy. Um, and you wanna make sure that again, people are heard and respected, it's a very volatile situation, and you wanna make sure that all parties are safe in the matter, and that's something that I am thinking about and preparing myself for, because I'm stepping out of the role of advocate and into the role of judge, and I wanna make sure that these people are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vogel, what is the number one legal issue you expect to deal with, and how are you educating yourself on that issue? Um, I think in the magistrate court system, there are a lot of issues that come in the doors um, and a lot of them might be tied to each other. I think the drug and alcohol problem could probably be at the top of the list because attached to that usually are either mental health cases or there's the domestic cases. Um, and I don't know as far as educating about it, but I think it's going to be the experience that you get um, looking at your resources you need the education as well as the experience to know how to handle each case because no case is going to be the same. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions for you to um, address. Um, and the next question, we will start with Division One. The West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct governs all judicial offices, including magistrates. Are you familiar with the code? And we will start in division one with Ms. Cesare. Yes, I'm familiar with the code. <laughs> you, have to, um, you have to know about it to be a lawyer and to be a judge. Um, I don't know what you, if you want me to comment on it, it's just basically you need to be fair and neutral. You, it's common sense. Um, is there, would you like? No, it's. That's fine. 
it's it's basically you know be a good citizen do the right thing use common sense don't um don't engage in anything that might be a conflict of interest treat everybody in your courtroom with respect have good judicial demeanor and that's actually one of the things that i um am really concerned with and and i really want to focus on as a magistrate is making sure that everybody in my courtroom feels respected, feels heard. And that's even including the people who work there. Um, that's really important if you're gonna have your cases flow um, and, and people feel as if they're having their day in court. So that, I think that's one of the biggest things about the rules of judicial conduct is, is having appropriate judicial demeanor and treating all people with respect. Thank you. Ms. Vogel. Uh, the West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct governs all offices, including magistrates. Are you familiar with the code? I am familiar with the code. Um, and along with that, I think the code, in my perspective, falls in line with your Army Corps values. You need to have respect. You need to have integrity. Um, you need to have honor. You need to be able to do the right thing, not use your position for power. Um, you need to have the selfless service to be able to serve the people who are coming into your courtroom because you are the people's judge. So as far as the code of, um, the code of conduct, it kind of goes along with my army Corps values that I have been trained and, and, and burned into my head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Chikariki, um, are you familiar with the West Virginia code of judicial conduct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I am. And, and again, we're to, to reiterate, reiterate what the other opponents have said as well, candidates have said as well, yes, you, you know, it, it's important that you be of good character and, and, and be a, a, have a good moral compass. That's the most important thing, in my opinion. Thank you. We'll now move to the candidates in Division Three. Ms. Silvius, are you familiar with the West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct? Yes, ma'am. I have looked through it and pretty much everything the rest of the candidates have said is pretty much sums it up. I mean, you have to be, you have to have good morals. You have to have good character. You can't um, be biased. You have to listen and you have to, um, you know, show respect to everybody, no matter the situation. We all are people. We all need to be treated fairly. Thank you. Ms. Roper, are you familiar with the West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I can elaborate uh, on the campaign side of it. I, uh, and you have been following it very well. There's things that we can't do uh, as a candidate for a judicial office that falls under those uh, rules of, of conduct. Uh, one of those is that we can't speak favorably or negatively about another candidate, not just the magistrate candidate, but any candidate, um, not the president of the United States, not a, a school board member. So um, those are also part of those rules, and I am familiar with them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, um, are you familiar with the West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct? Yes, I am, and um, I would have to say, just like the rest of the majesty said, because of my military background, since 1981, it was instilled in me, as far as, you know, the traits and the principles, as far as being biased, as far as being, um, having good mores, and um, the can-do attitude, the respect, the selfless service, the integrity, and just be biased, you know, and uh, just be fair, and just treat everybody equally, and that's basically what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've come to our, our final question, and I, I think it's a particularly good one to end on. Um, so we will start with uh, Division Three, and the question is, do you believe that all citizens have adequate access to legal help and court system and court to, and the court system? And if you if not, what can you do to make sure better access is provided. And we'll start with division three candidates with Ms. Roper. I, I sort of stumbled over that question. Do you want me to repeat it? I think I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My, 
my opinion is that the that the fair access to the legal system is available but what i find is hard to penetrate is that the rumors about the legal system kind of dominate and sometimes if they're not correct uh, people don't realize what their access is or, or what they have the right to uh, so i believe the system is um, accessible uh, for instance if a person does not have a, a lawyer present uh, i wait and i i will continue a case and give them adequate opportunity to apply for a public defender so that is one way that people think they know well i'll just represent myself uh but to really be to give them access to the the whole scope of of the law i'd rather have them represented by an attorney so uh yes the answer to your question is yes i do think that the access is there thank you uh, mr anderson let me read the question again do you believe that yes. all citizens have adequate access to legal help and the court system? And if not, how can we make access better? I just think that um, they do have access and I just, and it's my job to educate them with my knowledge and pretty much guide them to let them know what their options are, in my opinion. And um, to educate myself, Further, I will, you know, ask whatever questions has got to be asked so I can share with them. But they have to want to help and they have to want to be educated. Because a lot of times you get, you know, certain individuals and they'll say yes one moment, then the next moment they'll say no. So you have to guide them and just let them, let them know their rights, guide them through, and let's just hope that they make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Silvius, do you believe uh, citizens have adequate access to legal help? And if not, how do we make uh, better access? Um, I feel like the access is there. We've got, we've got things in place to help people. I just don't feel like um, a lot of people, they look at court as scary. They don't realize that um, as magistrates, we're there to help them. It's not all punitive. We're there to be helpful and, you know, inform them of their rights, let them know what's available to them. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that if they haven't been put in that situation. So I think the biggest thing we need to do is educate them, let them know what's there, give them the opportunity to take advantage of what there is to offer. Because if, you, if you're not involved in it, a lot of people just don't know what's there to help them and that they are entitled to things like a public defender or a victim's advocate and things like that. So I think it's just, um, more of an education for everybody. Thank you. We'll now uh, go to division one candidates. Uh, Ms. Vogel, do you believe that all citizens have adequate access to legal help and the court system? And if not, what can you do to make better access available? Um, I do believe that all citizens have access to um, the tools and the resources that they need when it comes to being set in court. So there was a Supreme Court trial back in 1963. It was Gideon versus Wainwright. That case set the, um, the standard for the right to free counsel, whether you could afford one or not. So with that case put in place, it gives everybody the right to a counsel. Now, whether or not they know how to find that counsel that's something that we might need to help them with the resources on. But I do believe that the resources are there. Thank you. Ms. Chikariki, would you like me to repeat the question? No, no, not okay. at all. Okay. I do believe that the system is accessible. And I think that there is also a, a great wealth of attorneys out there that are, are helpful to the defendants, as well as the public defender's office who do an amazing job and I know that even right down to the bail bonding companies, uh, the one that I work for included, is that if one of our defendants that we bond out is not familiar with how to apply for a public defender, 
we will actually walk them through the process um, with their paperwork and when they're there at our office, um, actually give them the paperwork that they can, we can fax it over to the courthouse or give them, you know, we'll put it in a envelope and stamp it and let them take it right over, put it in the mail. So I think that everything is there and it's accessible. Um, and I know that uh, with the magistrate role, I didn't know, I was under the impression that there was, they can kind of point them in the right direction, but they can't per se give the legal advice. So I think that there's, a, there's ample opportunities and options there for people to get, get good representation. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cesare, would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so with regards to the criminal side of things, um, Kristen was correct. Gideon versus Wainwright did set the standard providing counsel for people um, who are charged with crimes. And that applies for crimes that carry jail time. Interestingly, on the federal level, you don't get a lawyer until you have your the crime that you've been charged with carries in excess of six months. Um, but that's just a little fact. Um, so you and when you are charged with a crime that carries jail time at your arraignment, you're told that if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to you. So people are told about the ability to get an attorney to represent them um, at the time of arraignment when bond is set. Um, with regards to the other side of the coin, the victims uh, here in Jefferson County, we're fortunate that we have a really great victims rights advocate program, which helps to explain what's going on in the courtroom for the victims. So they feel like they're getting a little bit of representation that way. So that's really one, a really wonderful thing that we have here in Jefferson County. On the civil side of things, we have legal aid, but it, their funding is very, very limited and it's hard for them to represent everyone. So I would recommend that if someone finds themselves having to represent themselves that they do the research, they go to the library um, and, and check things out. Also, if you can afford a lawyer, I would interview at least more than one, maybe three lawyers would be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've now come to the part of the forum that uh, is the concluding remarks. And each candidate uh, will have two minutes to sum up and share with the voters what you wish. Uh, we're going to start with the division one candidates and Ms. Chikariki. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, first of all, again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of Jefferson County for hosting this forum and recording it so it can be viewed at a later time. Um, I, like many candidates here this evening, bring a myriad of experience and education to the table, um, whether it's a degree from an institution, life experience, or on-the-job experience. Um, my education is hands-on and life experience. I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer that, um, you know, you need to serve, to be there to serve the people. Um, you need to be a people person, have common sense, be fair, use sound judgment, utilize your resources. That's what they're there for. Um, as I stated before, it's easy to get on the wrong path. If given the right resources, you can help get someone back on the right path. And if they've strayed, air is human, it truly is. Um, I don't look down on people unless I'm helping them up. That's what resonates with me at all times. And during this time of uncharted waters with the COVID-19, which has made things interesting on, on every aspect, um, I've not been able to get out and door knock and talk to people and get to know people so in the community as much as I'd like to. So if anyone has any additional questions or they feel like they need to get to know me more, please feel free to reach out to me. You can look me up on Facebook. Um, you can even call me, you can email me. I'm accessible when I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. And again, I just wanna thank all of the candidates that attended tonight, took time out of their evening to come out and, and make themselves accessible. Um, to everyone that listens to this, I hope to have your vote on June 9th and stay well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cesare. Uh, you have two minutes to share your thoughts. Thank you. Um, as a judicial officer, a magistrate must remain neutral. Having practiced as both defense counsel and prosecution, I've earned a balanced perspective, and I know firsthand the importance of being fairly, of being fairly heard. I truly understand from personal experience the need for magistrates to leave their personal opinions at the courtroom door, and that the only thing that they should bring with them to the bench 
is a solid understanding and of the law and its application to the facts and good judicial temper temperament. I've practiced in every courtroom in the panhandle, magistrate, circuit, and federal. From this experience, I know what a good magistrate looks and sounds like. I know how to issue, uh, issue spot potential problems in cases, and because I have this skill set, I have the ability to schedule cases in a way that enable victims to be timely heard and defendants to have their speedy trial rights protected. Because this is a nonpartisan, nonpolitical race, the voters should only be concerned with qualifications. And as, a, and as an attorney with over 20 years of courtroom litigation experience, I am the most qualified candidate for this position. Magistrates hear legal arguments regarding individual statutory and constitutional rights, and it takes hard work and time to gain the type of legal knowledge that one needs to have in order to do this job competently. And I've done that hard work. The majority of the magistrate's docket is criminal, and I've practiced criminal law my entire career. Since my graduation from the WVU College of Law in 1993, it's been my goal to work in the public's interest. And I now seek to bring my qualifications and legal skills to serve this county as magistrate. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate your vote on June 9th. And if you'd like to learn more about me or what a magistrate does, you can go to my website. It's called chesaryformagistrate.com. And I also have a Facebook page called Chesery for Magistrate. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I should interrupt at this point and say that the league website will uh, have all your available contact information that you have uh, provided us. Um, Ms. Vogel, you have two minutes to sum up your thoughts. So I believe that not only does it take experience um, to be a good magistrate, but it also takes education and common sense. Um, going back to my Army Corps values, I raised my right hand when I was 17 to not only defend our country, but to become a better person. And that wasn't just for the duration of my Army contract. That was a pledge I made for life. As a magistrate, I believe that I will follow that pledge as far as leadership, integrity, selfless service, and duty to the people of Jefferson County. Um, I can leave my opinions at the door. I can look at each case as its own case because no case is gonna be the same. So each person needs to know that they have a unique case and that their case is gonna be heard differently, unbiasedly, and it's gonna be judged on fairly by what they have presented in their case. So hopefully on June 9th, the new voting day for West Virginia, you will vote for Vogel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now we've heard from all the Division I candidates. We'll now move to Division Three, and we'll start with Mr. Anderson. You have two minutes, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. I bring a young man that can identify with struggle. So no excuse for madness and disregard for others. I bring the ability to stand on the principles in which our country is built upon. That all men, women, and children are treated equally and fair. I would be committed, dependable, understand social awareness, be patient, and make good judgment. My values in Morris has prepared me to serve as magistrate. I am a good citizen, and this is one standard that all personnel and the Victim Advocacy Office represent. When elected magistrate in Division Three, I will enforce the laws and deliver justice for all citizens of Jefferson County. Collaboration prevents separation. Vote Osmond Anderson for magistrate, and I thank you all, as far as the ladies and women voters, for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Ms. Silvius, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, to wrap things up, I just want to say that being a local resident my whole life, this is something that's very important to me. My community is very important to me. It's something I love, and I've never had the desire to move away. 
I want to keep our our values and our community safe. I'm one of you guys. I'm just like everybody else. Um, a magistrate is a people's judge. I'm a people person. I am fair. I'm unbiased. I'm able to listen to both sides of everything. I can make sound decisions and I'm not afraid of the work. I'm dedicated to the county. I'm dedicated to the people of the county. Um, I feel like I have the ability to help reform and guide people. I'm there to help them get on the right path. As we've said, we're human, we make mistakes. People are gonna veer off the path, but if we can provide them the resources to make better choices, we can make better citizens for our community. So I'm hoping that you'll consider me as your magistrate in Division Three on June 9th, our new election day. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Roper. Would you like to share your thoughts with us for two minutes? Yes, I would. Thank you very much. In closing, again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for this unique opportunity to share our beliefs and values with the voters of Jefferson County. In case you're just tuning in, I am Arthena Roper, your newest magistrate serving in Division Three. I believe that the judicial system is the important part of the balance of our society. And I am honored to be a part of keeping that balance as a magistrate. I am asking Jefferson County voters to consider my high standards, my integrity, and my judicial experience when deciding who to vote for as magistrate in division three. If I am elected magistrate in division three on June 9th, I pledge to continue to represent Jefferson County with integrity. A vote for me is a vote for fair and thoughtful judgment. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to express my thanks to all of the candidates for participating in this very new approach to voter education. Uh, this year, the League of Women Voters is celebrating our 100th anniversary. And I am pretty sure the early suffragettes never envisioned this type of cyber form. Your interest and commitment to this uh, form is wonderful and I, I can't um, thank you enough. This video will be available at the League of Women Voters website, uh, lwv-jc.wv.org. Of course, if you're watching it, you're already on the website. Um, and there will also be additional information there about the election, upcoming forms, and um, uh, web pages and sites for the candidates. I would like to give a special thanks to the League of Women Voters Board of Directors for participating in many, many trial runs of this technology. And a very special thanks to Terry Thorson, whose guidance and technical know-how made this forum possible. Remember the primary election date is now June 9th, as some of the candidates have mentioned. In-person early voting is scheduled to begin May 27th. If you choose to vote by absentee ballot, uh, the ballot must be postmarked by June 9th. Thank you everyone and stay healthy. This concludes the forum and we will now end the recording. Thank you.